All right, title of the sermon this morning is Comforting Truths in Hard Times. Comforting Truths in Hard Times. So I think it's good that, you know, even though people may be going through some difficulty uh, during these lockdowns, um, it's good to keep things in perspective and be reminded of, you know, some of the core truths in the Bible that will encourage us this morning. And that's what I want to talk about. And it's interesting that these three truths that I'm sharing with you this morning are all alluded to in Romans 8. So we'll go through um, a, a portion of the pa- passage, uh, or most of the um, passage in Romans 8, and talk about these comforting truths. All right, so number one, number one is life is short. Life, life is short in the grand scheme of things, isn't it? So we'll go to Romans 8, where this concept is alluded to where he says in Romans 8, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So life is short. So whether somebody's suffering from financial trouble or whether they're suffering from physical illness, physical sickness, disability, even persecution or even lockdown restrictions, right? even if they were to go on indefinitely, which we hope they don't, you know, life ultimately is short in the grand scheme of things. I mean, we're only going to be around here for a short time. So it's not going to last forever. Um, You know, at the resurrection, we will receive a new body and a new government, thank God, for a thousand years. And then there'll be the new heaven and new earth after that, where everything will be completely perfect. So this is where this idea here in Romans 8, where, you know, the sufferings of this present time being compared with the glory in eternity. It says, hey, it's not even worthy to talk about, like, comparing the two. You know, it's a bit, you know, of oxymoron here, where it's like, hey, it's not even worthy to be compared, even though in here he's, you know, it's obviously was worthwhile comparing it. So it's like, you know, it's um, interesting, that sort of uh, poetry there. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. So this is talking about one day we're we're groaning together with creation, but one day we're going to receive a new body where all these things will be over. And, you know, it's, it's only going to be for a short time that we are here in the grand scheme of things. But when you're in the thick of it and when you're going through it, it always seems a lot longer than it really is. And we start to focus on the now rather than having that eternal perspective, realizing, you know, I shouldn't be depressed during this time. I shouldn't be losing my joy. I shouldn't be, you know, so uh, debilitated mentally and spiritually that I can't pick myself up in the morning and still be joyful in the Lord because ultimately it's, it's, it's a short period of time in the grand scheme of things. And I think if we have that perspective, it'll help us to, to maintain our joy in the Lord. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. See, so we understand that this is there's a temporary suffering that's going on now. Whatever that suffering is, obviously it changes throughout time and in different people's circumstances, but it is only until now. For not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, right, to wit the redemption of our body. So that's when we're adopted physically into God's family. We are born spiritually into God's family. But the body is, when we get our new body, it's referred to as an adoption, right? For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he yet hope for? But if we, with, if we hope for that which... That we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. See, so he's saying that if you have this eternal view, right, and think about this eternal timeline, then you're able to go through the groaning and travailing much easier, right? Because now that you have this hope that you don't see, then you with patience, right? And patience in the Bible is this endurance and going through hard times. With patience, you're able to go through it and wait for it. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. The same uh, concept here. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Right. So the fact that this new creature, the Holy Spirit is in us as well, but it's in an earthly body 
right now. So there's trouble here, there's pain, there's suffering, there's problems in the world. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. So you see how that, you can go through these hard times, but that doesn't mean you need to be down, right? You can be troubled, but not stressed, distressed. You can be perplexed, right? Like you're not really sure what to do, but then you still have hope, you're not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Isn't that interesting? So the world may persecute you, but why? You know, God says, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee, right? You've always got people. There's always a faithful remnant, right, that takes a stand. Cast down, but not destroyed. Yeah, you might get beaten down, but you're not going to be, like, eliminated, right? Always bearing about in the body, of, uh, uh, body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. And, you know, that's another thing to keep in mind as well. Not only am I talking about life being short, but then, the, I mean, the suffering that even we are going through now, where we've, you know, maybe lost our jobs or lost some freedoms and lost these things. I mean, just so people don't get depressed during these times, I mean, compared to real persecution, we're not there yet, you know. Maybe we'll get there eventually in this country. You know, maybe we'll, there will just be segregation, but not actual physical abuse. But you know, in back in those times, I mean, people actually bled for just trying to live about their faith, and, and we're not at that point. So we should be at least thankful for that. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. So you see again this concept of, yeah, we go through suffering. One day it's going to be over, right? One day it's going to be done and, and finished and we're going to be resurrected again with our new bodies. We're going to be risen into that glorious liberty, the Bible says, of the sons of God. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. See, knowing this eternal view, we don't give up, right? We don't lose hope when people have just this, etern this, this temporary perspective. They, they get in despair. They give up. They lose hope. And the Bible's saying here, no, we as Christians ought to have the eternal perspective, knowing that anything we do here is laying up treasures in heaven that we shouldn't faint, right? When we go through any sort of trouble and hard times. But though our outward man perish, so even though maybe this body may be killed, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment. So you see how if we realize in terms of eternity that life is short, even the, the things that he's listed here in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul is able to write under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. It's our light affliction. Why? Because it's but for a moment. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of of glory, right? If we suffer in the right way, right? If we do go through this with patience and with hope and the right frame of mind, it's still serving God. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal, right? So we realize life is short, no matter what sort of suffering we go through. I mean, it's for a temporary period. So don't lose hope. Don't be depressed during this time. Um, you, know, you know, take joy in the Lord that, you know, one day is going to be over and any sort of suffering we go through it will be over. James 4 verse 13, a very famous passage about just the brevity of life. Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. That's how short life is. And often we talk about um, the brevity of life. Well, today we're talking about the brevity of life in terms of suffering, right? And it's, it's a comforting thought that 
any suffering you go through will not be forever. It's a, it's, a, it's a brief period, and one day you'll look back on your life and where would it all gone? But the other side to this truth, you know, the double-edged sword of this truth is we're reminded that life is short and we only have so much time to do things of eternal value. And, you know, that's why it's sometimes good. I preached this a few weeks ago that even when we go through hard times, it reminds us, you know, what are we really doing with our life? Are we spending our time and our resources and our life in a way that is benefiting, you know, I guess society and benefiting God's kingdom? Or are we just living for ourselves? So the fact that life is short reminds us of these things, but it also comforts us because any sort of suffering we go through is not forever. Second Peter 3, this is the perspective we should have when we realize life is short and we only have so much time on this earth. And, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, I always think about when life is short, you know, when people, and I did it in a sermon once, where you, if you sort of block out your life in hours and you say, well, eight hours you're sleeping and so many hours you're traveling and so many hours you're eating and so many hours you do this, there's really not that much time left in the day. You know, I mean, think, can, you, can you believe that a third of your life is spent in bed? You know, we say we live like you know, 80 years or 90 years, but a third of that you're sleeping. You know, and yet, uh, you know, we have to be reminded of this because, I mean, we waste so much of our life, don't we? We may waste so much of our time just doing vain things. And there really isn't that much life to live uh, when you think about it. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us with, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So one day this earth will be all gone. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? I always love just how this verse, this phrase, I don't know, I just, I just love this passage because it's just it's a passage about reminding us that all these things are temporary, life is short, you know, and we work and we slave for all these things, but it's reminding us, you know, we really shouldn't be living that sort of way and having that sort of attitude. Like we, sh we should be realizing that one day all these things are gone, have that eternal perspective, and it's sort of putting the question to you in a statement saying, well, what sort of person should you be? Like how should you be living if you know this truth, right? And uh, I think that's something that's always confronting for many Christians because we know these truths. We don't always live consistently with them and that's why it's a good reminder for us. Right? Ephesians 5. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So you see... Many Christians are asleep at the wheel, right? We're asleep to what is really important in this way. We may be awake and going about our daily life, but spiritually we're sleeping, right? To, to this truth and what's important really in life. And the Bible's saying here, hey, wake up, right? Walk circumspectly, not as a fool, but as a wise man, Right, realizing these truths and things that are valuable in the world, redeeming the time, right? Because there's not much time there, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Those are the people that are eyes open but asleep spiritually, right? They're not understanding what the will of the Lord is, and therefore they spend their time on vain things. We don't want to do that. Life is short, but Today we're talking about how that would comfort us, right? Because if we're going through hard times, hey, it's not going to go forever. Second one from Romans 8 is a very famous concept as well, that all things work for good. All things work for good. Now, there's a caveat here in Romans 8 because some people think, well, everything just always works for good. Well, in Romans 8, it says here in verse 26, likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, 
because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So it's not just a blanket statement that everything we do, you know, even regardless of what, what we care about, God will, will work together for good. But it's all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So there are things that don't always work to good, right? But you know, God has grace as well, right? And sometimes people, you know, they <laughs> you know, confess their sins to God and whatnot. You know, God will eventually use it for good. But we can know that if we are trying our best to serve God, right? We're trying to walk in the Spirit, that oftentimes many of the hard things we experience in our life and a lot of the suffering we experience has a greater purpose that's molding us and working for good. And we may not see that, uh, we may need to trust, even though we may not see where it ends up. Romans 8, For we, whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. So all things work together for good to them that love God. It's not always easy to see how things will come out, you know, and it might be bad decisions that we make, you know, mistakes that we do, either past or present, um, of your own doing or of others, right? You know, uh, but these things that we go through in life can often teach us, you know, resilience, character building, you know, they can work together for good. You may not see the end of it now, but as you look back, on these things you'll see like how this worked in your life to get you where you are today and maybe change your perspective on things today um like i mentioned earlier on i mean think about the the trouble that people are going through now with these lockdowns and with these restrictions and the restrictions on our liberty and it's waking them up i mean it's waking them up to not only the political problems in our world but it's waking them up to spiritual problems too i mean even christians are now you know, appreciating the freedoms that they once had and all these sorts of things. So it, it, it has good come out of it, even though it's not an ideal situation. And this idea of going through suffering that, also, that perfects us, this is really what Jesus Christ did, you know, and, and sets the precedent for us. Philippians 3, 7, But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. So you see how Paul is able to say, hey, all these things, even if I lost them all, compared to Jesus Christ, he counts them as dung, right? That I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable, conformable unto his death. So part of Paul getting to know his Lord Jesus Christ was going through hard times. And this is why hard times can often work together for good because it teaches us more to be like Christ who went through the ultimate suffering on our behalf. James 5, we read about some of the Old Testament prophets, especially Job. And we can see here again that Job obviously is the, you know, pure example of somebody who goes through suffering and yet at the end of it comes out on top, right? Comes out, there's the good that comes from his trial and tribulation. James 5, take my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. So you can see there that word I talked about in previous sermons, patience in the Bible is not just talking about waiting and being patient like we would use the word. It's talking about going through those hard times, enduring, right? That consistency of going through it. Behold, we count them happy which endure. So isn't that interesting that, you know, we look back, you know, on people like Job, on people that have suffered in the Old Testament, and we go, wow, you know, like they, they you know, you know we, we kind of think, hey, look how God blessed them, look how God used them, right? 
we look back at the disciples and we think, oh, wouldn't it have been great to walk with Jesus and talk with Jesus and how God greatly used them. But how did he use them? He used them like through hard times. He used them by molding them and doing, they, they, they didn't live like we live today, right? And yet they were used greatly. So it's sort of like, isn't it ironic that, you know, when we go through hard times, we get all down and, and lose our joy and all that. And yet we look back at examples in the Bible, like he's saying here about Job, and says, hey, we count them happy, which endure. We say, hey, isn't it great that they got to go through that and see how God used them? And yet we go through hard times. We don't have that perspective of, hey, isn't it great that we can go through these hard times and God can use us greatly? You have heard of the patience of Job and you've seen the end of the Lord that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Right? So all these things work together for good to them that love God. Job is the perfect example of this in the Bible. And look at what he says in Job 23. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand where he doth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand that I cannot see him, but he knoweth the way that I take when he hath tried me. I shall come forth as gold. I shall come forth as gold. So hard times mold us. Um, but another benefit to going through hard times is not, because sometimes we always think about the benefit to ourselves, right? So to ourselves, we go through the hard times and we think that's, you know, we, we try and have the lens of faith and we say, well, that's good. God is molding me and I'm going to be growing and becoming more like Christ. But also a benefit to going through hard times is our ability to help others. You know, because remember when we serve, we serve with joy, Jesus, others, and then yourself. So yes, there is that application of how it's helping me, but even a greater purpose to that suffering that you go through is any discomfort you go through or hard times you go through equips you to be able to be a comfort to other people. So, you know, if you've lost your job in this time, if you've going through hard times, if you've suffered from mental anguish and mental illness or, you know, these sort of things, if you've struggled to have joy in your life, then now you can now understand and empathize with people that have the same issue. So it's, it, that's a good thing there that can work for good for future service to God's people. 2 Corinthians 1, look at this. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, look at this, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So you see how they're going through hard times allows you to experience the comfort from God right, which is one thing that it works together for good. And then you who have experienced this comfort of God are able to explain and help others also, also understand that comfort from God, right? That's one of the reasons why God wants us to go through sufferings so that, verse 5, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. So in order for you to experience that maximum amount of comfort, you need to go through some level of discomfort, right? So you go through the suffering to experience the comfort, and then the more that abounds, the more the consolation abounds. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. All right, so there's a positive, a couple of positives there with going through suffering and how it works together for good and how you know molds us and allows us and helps us to mold up, help mold others as well so life is short right all things work for good and if you're paying attention when we we're reading through romans 8 you'll notice that Romans 8 ends on this beautiful passage about eternal security you know once saved always saved that god will never leave us who shall separate us from the love of God. You know, because, you know, ultimately when all else fails, salvation doesn't. You know, and this is why no, no, no Christian should lose their joy 
in the Lord. Even though we may have some temporary discomfort, we should always have joy knowing that one day it's all going to be over, all these things are working for good, and even though everything goes to absolute, you know, dung, <laughs> we will always be saved. There's nothing that can take away that salvation from us. And we need to remember this. So I'm not saying that Christians will never experience depression. Christians will never experience hardship, you know, and Christians will never struggle with having the joy. Why? Because we live in the flesh. And we have the flesh, and just like it's just as a struggle to do right and to do wrong, part of doing right is having the right perspective. Right? Part of doing right is having the right mindset and having that positive mindset and looking to eternal things so that we don't fall into the depression of the flesh and all that stuff. And this is why it's important for us to remember that no matter how bad things get, it'll be over one day. And you, if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be certain 100% that you can, you will experience this glorious liberty of the sons of God that Romans 8 talks about, right? But we'll continue from verse 31 in Romans 8. What shall we say to these things? Right, this is the, the, the groaning and the travail that Romans 8 is talking about, that we're going through. What shall we, if God be for us, who can be against us? Right? You know, it doesn't mean that we're going to have every victory in this physical life, but what it means is even though we may lose the battle, we won't lose the war. We don't lose the war because God ultimately wins and we will one day be delivered into liberty. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And that reminds me of that passage in, you know, in 2 Peter where it's like, what manner of persons ought ye to be? You know, it's like, why would we live a life just striving for riches and comfort and wealth when one day, when it's all over, I mean, God's going to give us, you know, probably even that and more so, you know, in the, in the next life, right? And all the things that we would want to enjoy now, there will be time for that, right? But now is not the time for that. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Right? So there's a, there's a passage that sort of alludes to our justification in Jesus Christ that you know, he's removed our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. So he's going to lay anything against us because God has justified us right? in Jesus Christ. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I don't know how people can read you know, this passage and still think people can lose their salvation. I mean, I, I would say that you know, Paul is quite clear here, um, listing all these different examples of things that could possibly make you lose your salvation. And, and you know, he's saying none of these things can separate you from the love of God. I, mean, I don't know if there's anything here that, that is not covered by one of these topics, right? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. So these are some of the physical things that we go through. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. How, how do you be more than a... It's like you're more than a conqueror, so you win, but you're more than that. So you're like more than a victor. Like you're more than a winner, right? And I guess it's because we don't only win the war, right? We win the war and we also get to experience, you know, bliss in, for all eternity. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us, you know? For I am persuaded that neither death nor life. So you see how there, there was the physical persecution he talked about before, but now he talks about, but not even death nor life, nor angels, so there's like spiritual beings can separate us from the love of God, nor principalities, nor powers, right? So these are like, you know, powers in the world, and authorities in the world, principalities, nor powers, nor things present. So you see how, you know, what, what, can, what, can, what can separate us from the love of God that can't be defined as things present, you know, like things that exist now, you know? nor things to come. So there's your, you know, how can you lose salvation? Nor things to come is included in the who shall separate us from the love of God. Nor height, 
nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So no matter what happens in life, there will, you will always be saved. You know, if you've believed, you have to have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the, the if there. If you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's free. You just put your faith on Him. There's a lot, you know, that you can mess up in life. But this is not one of them. Thank God. You know, once you have received it, you know, the only messing up you can do is if you don't receive it, right? That's the ultimate messing up in your life is that you do not believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And once you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's easy, that's free, it's by faith, by grace through faith, nothing you can do can mess that up. And I mean nothing. You know, people say, well, what about this? What about that? It, it, nothing. Right? I don't know if Paul has made that abundantly clear in, uh, in Romans 8, and yet people still believe that. But that's why you know, we take the view in our church and those that believe in eternal security that you know, the verses that are often used to, to take away eternal security have another explanation, right? Because the, the, the Bible is so clear that we have this eternal life. John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. It's the same hand that is keeping us secure in the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. What is this record? This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All right, so that's the important distinction. Do you have the Son of God? Have you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, this is not a, a difficult thing to do. But it's, it's something we need to make sure we have done, right? That we've put our faith on Christ, received Him as our Savior. And from that moment on, we don't have to worry anymore. But if you don't have the Son, you don't have life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. See there, the Bible tells us we can have 100% assurance of our salvation if we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We can know we have eternal life. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You know, this is such a, I think, an important verse in the context of what we're talking about now in terms of being content with such things that we have. Right? Be happy with what we have, whether we have much or whether we have little. Why? You know, we're talking about in this sermon, you know, no matter how hard things get, no matter the hard times, you're always going to have salvation. And this is why we can be content, right? Content means we can, we can have joy. We can be satisfied, you know? That doesn't mean we... Content doesn't mean that you don't strive for better. But content means that whether or not you achieve that better or whether you lose what you have, you're still happy. That's what content means. And why can you be content? Because no matter whether you have lots or little, you always have the Lord Jesus Christ. For because He hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. You may forsake the Lord, but God will never forsake you. That's why this, the way this is phrased is so important. It's not, I will never leave thee if you don't forsake me. This is, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Right? Titus 1, 2, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And 1 John 2, This is the promise that he hath promised us, even eternal life. So, whether it's going through hard times, you know that we always have salvation. But, you know, but sometimes as well, you know, this, this truth and why it's so comforting that it's not always the hard times that are imposed on us that we know God says he'll never leave us nor forsake, that he's promised us eternal life. Sometimes it's even the hard times that we've imposed on ourselves, right? The sin that we fall back into, right? The problems that we get ourselves into. You know, we're walking in the flesh and we have trouble in our life, whether it's relationships, financial, you know, all the things that people go through, even health problems we might have brought on ourselves. But 
even in those times where we are the cause of our own suffering, God still did not forsake you. This is why you can't mess up salvation. And that's why even if you've brought suffering on yourself, you, know, you can still have joy in the fact that even though I messed up maybe my physical life, I cannot mess up my salvation. And it's in this eternal life that you, I think you, people often have to realize this is how much God loves us. You know, that God's love is unconditional once we've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? And it's that love that ought to drive us to want to serve God. That, you know, it's not just God getting us through the hard times, it's even self-inflicted hard times. And yet God still loves us and works things for good, you know, if we will turn back to Him, right? Second Corinthians 5, it's the last one we'll end on. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. That he that died, that, that, that he died for all, that they which live, that's us, should not henceforth. What is it saying? From this moment, from that, from the moment that you get saved, you realize these things. You should not, from this moment onwards, henceforth, live unto yourself, right? Live unto themselves. But how should we live? Unto him which died for them and rose again. So the last thought I want to leave you with is. Yes, we are talking about these comforting truths that comfort us in hard times. But I don't want the thought to stop there that's, hey, this is great and how it comforts me. I want you guys to consider that through these comforting truths, we're reminded of God's love for us. And that love for you, that Jesus Christ died for you, that you should not henceforth live unto yourselves, but unto him which died for you, and rose again. Right? So let's be reminded of that truth that this love of Christ should constrain us to serve Him. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, um, for your love. Thank you that uh, your love is expressed through the words of the Bible. We have these words, and these words can comfort us, give us comfort through these hard times. Lord, help us not to be self centered around these truths. Lord, may we consider how these truths, yes, help us, but how. These truths and this comfort we experience can help others. And Lord, may it compel us to live for you. So we um, thank you, Lord, for this reminder this morning and the comfort that you give us, Lord, through your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.